Walter Block just told me when we, I was leaving our office and said, uh, look, you know, try to, to give your talk a free enterprise line, not your usual interventionist crap. So I will try to do this now, the, the deflation lecture. Uh, let's start with a few uh, definitions. So uh, after World War I, oh, excuse me, this is an error, after World War II, uh, actually, deflation has been commonly defined as a sustained decrease of the price level, which is uh, therefore then an analogous definition to the one uh, of, of inflation, which is an, a sustained increase of the price level. Uh, so we talk also in this case of uh, price deflation. There are two important elements of this definition. Is, uh, first is, is the level. Uh, so it must be that there be a decrease of the price level, not of individual prices. And the second element is that this decrease must be sustained. Traditionally, that is, before World War II, deflation has been defined as a decrease of the money supply, which previously had been artificially increased. And here we talk, therefore, of deflation in the narrow sense. Okay, I mean, def definitions ultimately are uh, just a starting point for analysis, starting point for scientific inquiry. Uh, it's not, right, it's, it's, it's important to distinguish the substantial issues in, in a definition and the terminological ones. Uh, there are certain uh, Austrians who insist that words only be used in a certain sense, inflation, deflation, means this or that. Uh, I think this, uh, these uh, quibbles are very often not very fruitful Right, but it is important, on the other hand, to distinguish phenomena. So we have here two phenomena. phenomena. One is in a, a change of the price level, here a decrease of the price level. We need to distinguish this from a decrease of a money supply that had been previously uh, increased or artificially increased, uh, which are two different things. It's not necessarily the case that the two go together. Of course, uh, here, let me just uh, highlight this word, artificially increased. Uh, but it is, after all, there is also something like natural money production. For example, if we have a free market economy and we had a precious metal monetary standard, then there would always be some natural production of money. That would not be inflation. And by the way, there would also be no tendency then for deflation to exist. So this definition of, this traditional definition of uh, deflation brings us back to the Latin root of the word, which is deflare, uh, as uh, opposed also to inflare, right, so inflate, so to blow up uh, an artificial increase. Deflation then, in the, according to this definition, brings the money supply back to its normal level, and this normal level is not necessarily the previous level. Right? For example, you could have an artificial increase of money, money substitutes, as in the case of fractional reserve banking, if then fractional reserve banks become bankrupt, become uh, illiquid, uh, so um, they, they leave business, the money supply shrinks. But it does not necessarily shrink to the previous level. It shrinks to the level defined by the base money, that is, by uh, money in the, in the proper sense. Right? If these fractional reserve banks operate on a gold standard, they have increased uh, their own issues uh, in excess of the, the reserves that they hold, they are fractional reserve banks, and then it might be that during uh, the, uh, the, the time the gold stock increases do, due to the production of gold. So the, uh, the money supply, the natural money supply increases, and what deflation does then is to bring back the money supply not to the previous level, but to the uh, level defined by uh, the underlying gold supply. Now, um, before I uh, present to you our lecture out, and we still make to, need to make uh, another little preparation by just highlighting the uh, different points of view that economists have on deflation. Deflation is a very uh, contested issue, and therefore it's also a very, very interesting issue, not only from a practical point of view, but also from a theoretical point of view. Keynesian economists oppose deflation and price deflation. And this is because, as we will um, still highlight uh, in some more detail, 
This is because Keynesian economists believe that the spending of money is the true engine of economic growth. So if spending diminishes, and it is likely to diminish if the price level diminishes, then we are in trouble. So the economy runs the risk of suffocation. Central banks, therefore, who uh, today operate under the virtual exclusive influence of uh, Keynesian uh, ideology, consider the fight against deflation of all sorts as one of their core missions. That is, deflation of all sorts be defined in, in, in the sense of a decreasing price level, especially in the sense of a decreasing money supply. And uh, nowadays, there are even some economists around who think that we should prevent that the rate of inflation ever diminish. Right? So this is a new kind of definition of uh, deflation. And if you have an inflation rate, let's say, of 5% year after another, then the deflation rate shrinks from 5% to 3%. This is already deflation. <laughs> okay. Right? So if the money supply does not expand quite as fast as before, wow, this is already deflation. So central banks, I know, this is not yet a majority opinion, but there are vocal expressions of this. So central banks consider the fight against deflation as one of their core missions. And we will see that this is not uh, completely uh, absurd. So there is a, a, a prima facie case for this. But we will also see that uh, this case is not very strong. Orthodox monetarist economists have traditionally op opposed deflation that is, a shrinking of the money supply, but not uh, price deflation. Milton Friedman, for, for example, has criticized uh, Federal Reserve policy in the early 1930s, uh, which, uh, according to him, failed to prevent a shrinking of the money supply. And he saw in this failure uh, the main cause of the Great Depression of the 1930s. And Friedman was not against permitting uh, the price level to decline at a constant money supply, or he actually recommended that the money supply be expanded at a, a fixed a low rhythm, some 3% or 5% per year, and uh, uh, would let the, the price level adjust uh, freely under this, um, uh, under this policy. That is, if you increase, for example, the money supply each year by 3%, um, and the economy grows at a stronger rhythm, let's say 10% or 15%, then you would get actually price deflation, and Friedman would not have objected to this. Within the Austrian school, uh, of course, different uh, uh, traditions and so on. So there's one tradition that we can call the Visarian wing. This, this goes back to uh, Friedrich uh, von, von Wieser, one of uh, Karl Menger's pupils. The Visarian wing of the Austrian school which includes today uh, Lawrence White and George Selgin, opposes not only deflation, that is the shrinking of the money supply, but also price deflation, if such price deflation entails reduced aggregate spending. That is, uh, uh, White and Selgin would uh, uh, consider deflation to be non-problematic if prices shrink in a growing economy, if the total amount of money that is being spent within the economy rests at least constant. So in this case, for example, it's always the same amount of expenditure. You have a savings-based growth process, and we'll consider this in more detail later. Uh, then there would be more spending on uh, capital goods, less spending on consumer goods. Right? So the prices for consumer goods would fall. This would not be problematic for, uh, in the eyes of uh, Selgin and White. But if, for example, we have a case of an increased demand for money, increased cash holdings, and as a consequence, the total amount of money uh, that uh, is, is spent on capital goods and consumer goods diminishes because people are holding back their money, right? There's like uh, hoarding, so they're sucking the lifeblood out of the economy. This would be very harmful, according to Selgin and White. Now, as opposed to this, we will take uh, the position that both deflation and price deflation are beneficial in virtually all cases. I won't go into detail about this, this virtually all cases. There is, in fact, a, a case uh, that I would consider uh, to be harmful, namely the case in which deflation is artificially brought about by government interventions. And this can be done in various ways. But we won't address this today. But in virtually all cases, that can happen 
uh, in a free market economy, uh, deflation is beneficial. So how will we go about this? Um, we will uh, focus on th uh, three points. We will uh, discuss first a little bit the causes of price deflation, and then go into more detail analyzing price deflation resulting from two causes, namely, in the first case, uh, from monetary reform, and then also uh, from savings-induced growth. And if we really have uh, much time, which I doubt, we might even talk a little bit about deflation spirals. The fear, very important, it's not actually a book, it's a little uh, brochure, which is on sale downstairs. <laughs> it's a very promising author, and he's... Uh, <laughs> It makes a quite, quite good case, actually, for the, for the subject of my lecture. Okay, so let's uh, look at the causes of, of price deflation. And uh, here we can distinguish the immediate causes and the more remote causes. There are always more remote cause, causes, right? Each cause has in itself another cause and so on. So you can trace this back indefinitely. And the question, how far do you trace it back, ultimately, well, it depends very often on pragmatic considerations. Uh, and we'll just push the causal analysis so far that we can get a hold of our two main scenarios. So the immediate causes of deflation are a decreased aggregate demand and uh, an increased production, increased aggregate production. Decreased aggregate demand, so this is what the uh, Keynesians uh, call, this is Keynesian vocabulary, right? Aggregate demand. So it's the total amount of money that is being spent on uh, economic goods. This is aggregate demand. So if, our spend, if the amount of money that uh, people spend increases and the amount of goods remains the same, and then there's a tendency for prices to increase because people, and, uh, different owners of money, will bid up prices in a competitive process, so the prices will tend to increase. If the to total amount of money that is being spent on economic goods diminishes for the same reason, right, there will be a bidding process that pushes prices down. So it's the first immediate cause. The second immediate cause is uh, decreased production. And we might also, well, actually would have been more... Uh, Correct to say, uh, de um, increased supply. Right? It, usually the supply increases only due to production. Right? If there are more goods and services that are now being sold within the economy for the same amount of money, right, then of course there's a tendency due to competitive bidding to, for prices to decline. Just as inversely, if, there were, if the supply would shrink, for example due to war or due to greater laziness, when you no longer like to work, right, then uh, the same amount of money would bid for a reduced amount of goods that were being exchanged, so the prices would increase. Okay, so then the question is, what are the more remote causes? That is, what are the causes of a decreased aggregate demand? What are the causes of an increased supply? Okay, so we'll look at this. The causes of a, a decreased aggregate demand, uh, more remote causes, are an increased demand for money. That is, uh, demand for cash balances, also called hoarding, also known as hoarding, right? This is hoarding. And on the other hand, a reduction of the money supply. So again, in, in decreased aggregate demand means we are spending less money on the available goods and services. Why do we spend less? Well, either because the amount, the supply of money that we can spend has been reduced, or because the supply, while the supply has uh, remained the same, we now choose to hold back more than we held back before. Right? So less money is being spent, aggregate demand diminishes. On the other hand, uh, production uh, can increase, and production can increase due to natural causes and also due to man made causes. Now let me go. One step further back, let me trace the causal chain just one step further back. And again, right, we could go on, but we'll, we'll stop after the next step. So let's look now at the, the causes of an increased demand for money. 
actually several causes. There's a whole theory of the demand for money, and I'll just highlight uh, two of such causes. Uh, one such cause is a higher uncertainty in the economic environment. For example, uh, in, the, in the past three or four years, uh, uncertainty has increased. The economy was very fragile. So as a consequence, uh, many firms, in particular firms operating on the financial markets, have increased their cash balances. Right? There have been investment firms uh, that have invested virtually all of their money in, uh, in liquidity, that is, in cash balances. Right? Not only dollars, but actually the dollar was not very popular, but also euros and uh, Norwegian coronas and Swiss francs and, and so on. Right? So they have sold uh, stocks and, and bonds that they owned before, and they kept the money. So they were increasing the demand for cash balances, and of course this is a way to protect yourself. If uh, uh, we are in a difficult economic situation if, uh, that is crisis prone, right, it means that the monetary value of things that we own, our house, our car, uh, financial assets and so on, might shrink. But of course if you hold cash, then the value of cash is, uh, is what it is. Right? If you have a hundred dollar bill, the, its value will not. That is, its purchasing power might shrink, but it will always be a hundred dollar. Hundred dollars. Right? Whereas, if you own GM stocks, let's say, and it was a hundred dollars before, and now it shrinks to five, uh, you have lost a lot of money. Okay. So people demand more cash, and this, of course, entails decreased aggregate uh, uh, demand, and therefore exercises the deflationary pressure. Another possible cause of an increased demand for money is the introduction of money of a higher quality. If uh, we were uh, in the United States to bring about a transition from the current fiat money system to a commodity money system, we would introduce gold or silver back as money, uh, then we would uh, create a, a money, bring about a money with a better, of a better quality. And as a consequence, the demand for such money would increase. Traditionally, before the 20th century, let's say even before the 19th century, the main technique for people to hold their savings or to save was to uh, hoard money. Okay. It was a traditional savings uh, technique. Why did they do this? Well, because they knew that the gold coins and the silver coins would by and large preserve their purchasing power and even increase in purchasing power. Today, of course, it would be suicidal. I do not recommend that any of you hoard dollars or euros or whatever, and even Swiss francs, uh, for your savings. Why would it be suicidal? Because these monies are inflated constantly, so their purchasing power diminishes. Right? Therefore, nobody today saves in cash. But if we were to reintroduce gold or silver as money, then many people would start again, rediscovering the wisdom of the ages and save cash. Right? So the transition to a better quality money would bring about a transition to different ways of saving, one of which would be uh, a larger uh, a larger demand for cash balances. So deflationary pressure. What are the more remote causes of um, the money supply? Here in particular, again, just highlight one uh, such causes, one uh, such cause which are bank insolvencies. And bank insolvencies bring about deflationary spirals. If a, a bank goes, let's say Citibank goes bankrupt, Citibank is not in good shape right now, the Citibank goes bankrupt, what does this mean? It means that from one day to another, as soon as it gets known that Citibank is bankrupt, you will not, as a, as a customer of Citibank, you will not be able to pay anything with a check drawn on, on Citibank, okay, or with a credit card issued by Citibank. In other words, all the money, or the bank money that has been created by Citibank will evaporate. So a part of the money supply evaporates. Okay? So this exercises then uh, deflationary uh, pressure and entailed spirals, but I won't go e uh, into this. Now, if we turn to uh, the more remote causes of uh, uh, increased production, so we have here natural causes and, and man-made ca uh, causes. Uh, natural causes might, for example, be better uh, uh, climatic conditions. So, for example, if there is really global warming, then certain parts of the world that before were uh, not usable for agricultural production, Greenland and so on, might become usable, so this might actually give a, a push to aggregate production. Right? It would be less costly to use those lands and 
aggregate production might increase. And this would entail a deflationary pressure. Among the man-made causes, uh, we have in particular to mention a higher savings rate. Right? And this entails uh, the scenario of deflationary growth, about which we will talk in more detail. Uh, more entrepreneurship, which is a cultural factor, right? So you can have uh, some countries have an entrepreneurial culture, and they they, they prever- preserve this and encourage this. You have uh, of classes and so on. Entrepreneurs are p- perceived as something positive within the economy, and this will then uh, entail uh, the creation of better technology and facilitate the discovery of additional resources. And finally, let's not completely uh, get this out of the picture. It's also possible that we get better economic policy. It might be a dream, but (laughs) on logical grounds, we cannot completely exclude it. And and sometimes, right, there are revolutions in economic uh, policy uh, brought about. And, uh, of course, uh, policy is actually the greatest man-made obstacle to increase production. I mean, uh, uh, we can talk about earthquakes and floods and so on, none of this is, uh, can, can match right, the destruction brought about by, by governments uh, leading economies into war and uh, pursuing uh, stupid economic policies and so on. Okay, so in this case, too, pro- uh, production would increase and there would be deflationary pressure. So we have now an overview over the main causes of deflation and we will uh, focus on the the following three, that is, in particular on the first one, the better uh, quality of money, the higher savings rate, which is down, and then eventually, if we have a little time, on bank insolvency. So let's first turn to the scenario in which we bring about a transition to a better kind of money. and therefore have price deflation resulting from monetary reform. The scenario that we are considering here is a return to the gold standard, which was mean, as I've already pointed out, uh, more savings in gold, so more savings in, in cash balances, less money would be spent on consumer goods, less money would be invested. And it's useful to analyze uh, this scenario under two different hypotheses, uh, which we consider a first case in which uh, all companies are financed just with equity. That is, no company has any debt. And the second scenario would be a debt economy in which there would be very few equity and uh, a lot of debt. So in a pure equity economy, uh, if you know, I mean, we. Of course, our government would still be indebted, but we would have no private debt. Uh, And the implication is that no bankruptcy is possible. You cannot go bankrupt if you don't have debt. You just run out of money. That's not bankruptcy. It's different. So that's the situation that you guys face always at the end of the month. You're not bankrupt, but you just run out of money. In a debt economy, all companies are financed out of credits. And here then... uh, that bankruptcy is possible and even likely. So why do we make this distinction? Because uh, it's actually only in the second case that deflation creates uh, those problems for, for those it is, for which it is feared. Okay. So let's fir- focus uh, on the first case. First, uh, under two, again, under two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that uh, all prices change proportionally Uh, to the money supply. That is, to the variation of the money supply and also to the uh, variation of the demand for money. So if there is a 10% increase in cash holdings, uh, this would imply uh, a 10% decrease of all prices. Now, if all prices change exactly by the same proportion, And this means that there's no real impact, neither on consumers nor on producers. Let's say as a a consumer, you have a household revenue of whatever, $1,000 per month, and you pay 
dollars per pound of tomatoes and you pay whatever three hundred dollars for rent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if all prices, let's say, fall by fifty percent, your revenue would shrink to five hundred dollars. You would pay one dollar for tomatoes, and you would pay one hundred and fifty dollars for rent. So your lifestyle, your activities won't be affected at all. Right? It's just the monetary expression that changes. This has been highlighted first by David Hume, an 18th century uh, uh, Scottish philosopher. He has uh, published a collection of uh, essays. It's also the title of the book, Essays. It's a wonderful collection. It's still worth reading today, so I, I do recommend that you do this. So Hume pointed this out, right? If all prices change exactly proportionally, there's no impact actually on our life, not no impact on consumers, and also no impact on producer. Let's say I've been uh, I've, I've been a whatever microphone producer, and I produce these, I sold these things here for whatever uh, twenty dollars per unit, uh, and I did so by hiring whatever one hundred and fifty people, and I paid them a, a hourly wage rate of uh, twenty dollars. Now, if there's a price deflation and all prices are cut by 50%, right, then I would sell my microphones for 10 and I would pay my, my people at $10 per hour. So it would, I would be in exactly the same. My business would be as profitable as before. Uh, there would be no impact on the conduct of my affairs. Right? So in this scenario envisioned by, by Hume and also by some later economists, uh, Deflation, and we might also say inflation, has no impact on the structure of production. The economy is not affected. Right? The real flow, the, the same real uh, quantities, quantities of uh, number of microphones, number of cars that are being produced, would not change. It would only be exchanged at a lower price level. That's all. Now, of course, this scenario, this hypothesis is not very interesting. It's only interesting as a hypothetic, uh, as a pedagogical device. Right? It's good to start from there. Then we can move on to a more realistic hypothesis. This is the hypothesis formulated by Richard Cantillon, even before you. You've already heard about Cantillon this week. So Richard Cantillon, in his book on uh, general considerations on trade, uh, excuse me, uh, the, the, the nature uh, of uh, commerce in general, uh, he analyzed the repercussions of an increase of the money supply. And if the money supply increases, then prices will change subsequently across time. And these prices will not be changed proportionally, but in different proportions. And so they do not change at the same time, they change at different proportions. And the consequence is always that uh, companies and individual households will be affected differently. Some companies will experience an increase in profitability. Other companies will experience a decrease of profitability. Right? Because for some companies, the, the prices of their products rise before the prices of their factors of production rise. So these companies will benefit. And then for other companies, the prices of their, their products will rise after the, the prices of their factors of production rise. So the costs increase first, so they are in trouble. And for households, it's the same thing. Some households... Uh, will experience an increase of their revenue before the prices of the consumer goods that they buy increase. So they benefit, they win. And for other households, their revenue will increase only after the prices of the things that they buy increase, which is, uh, uh, in the United States, the case for most people living out of, outside of Manhattan. So here we have uh, an impact, therefore, on the return on investments of, of different companies. We have an impact on uh, relative revenues, and therefore there will be a change of the structure of production uh, in the course of uh, creative uh, destruction. Now, the important point here is, therefore I use this, this expression, uh, creative destruction, is that uh, even under this hypothesis, there is no systematic aggregate impact. Right? So money, in this case, the demand for money is not neutral. Right? If the demand for money changes, this will have unequal repercussions on the different prices. Uh, so companies and different households will be affected differently, but there will be winners and there will be losers. Right? We cannot say that everybody is going to lose. That's simply not true. Right? Some 
uh, people will experience a stronger decrease of their costs, then uh, uh, there will be a decrease of their revenue, so these people will benefit, they can in increase their activities and so on. And for others, it will be the other way around. So, in this case then, deflation does not bring about an aggregate collapse of the economy, it just brings about a change of the structure of production, just such a, as such a change would result from an increased money supply. So we can conclude on this point that the demand for money is not neutral, uh, but uh, the resulting price deflation does not present any particular problems for entrepreneurs. Right? They still have the problem to uh, identify where are the line, which are the lines of business in which uh, the selling receipts will be higher than the amount of money I have to put down on the table to buy uh, intermediate products, tools, and to hire people. This does not change. So the economy is constantly, is never stationary, right? The economy is constantly in a, in a, in a flux. So there's always new branches of business that become profitable, other branches of business that become less profitable or become, uh, entail, incur losses. So the task of the entrepreneur is always to withdraw capital from those uh, sectors, from those firms that are likely to incur losses and to invest this, uh, this money into those firms that are likely to uh, have increased uh, revenue. Right? And in the inflationary scenario, it would be exactly the same thing. Yesterday, we've already talked about the, the question whether prices are sticky, do, do prices... Um, uh, is, is, is this whole scenario, is this, is this possible? And, and the, the answer that I've given, will, uh, which I will just restate now very quickly, is that uh, yes, prices are sticky, but the stickiness of prices is not a natural constant. Right? It's not like uh, the speed of light, and even in the case of the speed of light, <laughs> it's questionable whether this is really a, a, a constant. Right? Well, prices certainly are sticky, but this is a dependent variable. It depends on all kinds of things. In particular, it depends on the institutional environment. It depends on the, uh, the ability of entrepreneurs to convince uh, the people who cooperate with them, right? suppliers and, uh, and uh, employees. If we have uh, an environment uh, hampered by government intervention, so if governments prevent the prices fall uh, through price controls, for example, and also through unemployment, unemployment relief and public unemployment relief and so on, then prices, of course, become more sticky, and this whole process is very difficult to work out. But there is, in a market economy, there is no, uh, no such obstacle, and prices can become uh, very, very flexible in a market economy. Okay, now let's turn to the more interesting case of a debt economy. Here, again, we can make the uh, same two um, hypotheses, the Jungian hypothesis and the Cantillon's uh, hypothesis. So in the, in the first case, we now encounter the following problem. If prices fall, that is, if our revenues fall, then as we have seen, this does not represent a problem for the profitability of our investment, of our production. Let's say we own a firm and we're producing uh, pens or whatever, and we had an annual revenue of uh, $120,000, and our annual cost expenditure was also uh, was $100,000. Okay, so we invest $100,000 year in, year out, right? We invest $100,000, we earn $120,000. So we make a 20% profit, gross profit, before taxes. Now there's a deflation. All prices shrink proportionally, Hume's hypothesis. Our company will now earn $60,000. Our cost expenditure falls to $50,000. So we are as profitable as before. We still earn a gross return on investment of 20%. The problem is now the following. Where did we get the money from that we invested before, the 100,000? Well, we took out a credit. 
we promise to our banker, well, we'll pay you whatever, 15 or 20 percent, even if you pay 20 percent, so it's a credit shark. But we could do this, right? because we were earning, in fact, a return of investment on investment of, of 20 percent. Now the price level shrinks. We still earn 20 percent on our annual investment, but we have taken out a credit of $100,000 before. Right? So we now have an absolute uh, return, not a rate of return, an absolute return of $10,000. But we need $20,000 to service our debt, so we can no longer do this. See the problem? Right? So the, the shrinking price level makes it for, uh, in this scenario, uh, for all indebted entrepreneurs, impossible to service the debt that had been contracted at the previous higher price level. So we have a problem. Yeah, at, least, or at least these guys have a problem. Right. So what happens now? These guys go bankrupt. There will be a change of ownership. And this implies, of course, that in the short term, we will have an interruption of uh, production and therefore decreased real revenues. Right? If we interrupt our production, we need to say, well, well we say to everybody, uh, stop, right? To our supplier, stop, don't deliver anymore. I don't know whether I can pay. Say to our employees, uh, sorry, guys, uh, give me a break. Or something. Let's see, let's talk again next week or, or next month or something. And because we need to first uh, settle the little problem that our firm, that is me, has with, with our creditors. And by and large, there are only two solutions that can be worked out. Right. The first solution is we renegotiate the debt. Right. Is, you know, say, look, I mean, it's impossible for me to service this debt, but, no, but, but, but nobody can service this debt. Right. It's not just me. I mean, you will simply not see your money back. <laughs> You've given me $100,000, and I'm afraid I didn't do this on purpose, but it's, it, you won't see it back. Right. All prices are way too low now. Right. And so then the creditor might say, okay, so we'll work now. Uh, we renegotiate, for example, we reduce the, the interest rate that you have to pay me, or we reduce the, um, uh, the, the principal sum that you owe me. You owe me no longer 100,000, you owe me a 50. And that's what happens right, in practice, in most cases, actually. Second possibility to solve this is bankruptcy. Right? You say the creditor says, no, I mean, you owe me, and if you, if you cannot pay, then you go. And then the creditor, so the, either the company is liquidated, so it's, it's sold, or its parts are sold, and so on, or the creditor takes over. Now, for us, what is uh, crucial here is that the factor endowments, that is the, the real uh, uh, infrastructure of the, product, of the uh, structure of production, is not affected by this process. Right? It's not because an entrepreneur goes bankrupt that his company evaporates. I own a pen company, so I have machines, and I have a building, and so on, I have cars. It's not because I'm bankrupt that this all disappears. Right? It's not because I'm bankrupt that my employees lose their know-how, that they have forgotten suddenly how to make pens, and so on. Right? So all the real factors of production that what creates real wealth is still in place. What deflation entails in such a case is simply a redistribution of property. It's no longer the old entrepreneur who is the owner of the company. There will be new owners. Now, this is, of course, deplorable as far as he is concerned. But from an aggregate point of view, from the point of view of society as a whole, this is uh, it's not very important. It's not very important who runs the company. If he's really an able entrepreneur, it was just tough luck that he uh, hit a deflationary phase, well, then he probably will convince us his creditors, if they just renegotiate the debt, he will continue as before. Right? But if he was lighthearted and uh, operating, paying high factor prices in a deflationary environment, they might say, well, you go. They will put somebody into place who uh, is more uh, circumspect. So this means then that in the medium and the long term, there's no change in productive capacity. Right? So in the medium and the long run, of uh, ability to, to churn out consumer goods is not affected at all. And quite to the contrary, actually, uh, we have to expect now stronger growth because obviously the company was excessively in indebted. This, of course, stifled its flexibility uh, face to uh, the economy. Right? So reduced debt or, or no more debt, right? this is the, the great thing of this 
deflation-induced bankruptcy entails stronger growth because uh, the economy becomes less financially fragile. So these are the crucial considerations, right? The, the, the real economy right, is not affected from an aggregate point of view. Deflation, in, the, in this worst case, brings about a change of ownership, which is, by and large, irrelevant from the overall point of view. Things are not different in the case of the second hypothesis. Right? Uh, the only difference here is that some companies or households might, uh, might still be able to service their debt, right? because they are now winners and losers of the deflation. Right? The losers will, of course, be double <laughs> affected. It's not only that they, uh, they are no longer able to service the debt because their, their absolute net revenue has shrunk, but uh, they, have, they have no more red, net revenue at all. Right? They incur losses. And others might actually still be able to service the debt. For example, our entrepreneur, uh, right, he had before 120,000 uh, revenue and 100,000 cost expenditure. Now the deflation hits, and he might be a winner of the deflation. That is, his revenues increase relative to the, the cost. For example, his revenue might, in, uh, might fall to 70,000, from 120 to 70,000, right? and his cost fall from 100 to 40. Right? So he would still be able to service the debt that he had contracted at the previously higher price level, so he would not go bankrupt. But others, of course, would. And here, the same considerations apply that we have already analyzed under the first hypothesis. So, let us then conclude, preliminary conclude this, right? Uh, uh, are saying that even in the worst scenario, uh, deflation provides significant advantages from an overall point of view. These advantages are especially to, uh, to make the economy less fragile. A debt-ridden economy is fragile, crisis-prone. And this disappears thanks to deflation. It entails aggregate disadvantages in the short term, and even there, well, we could argue, are these true disadvantages if you solve a problem? Right? You go through a hard phase, but the hard phase is, is part of the problem-solving process. And there are significant medium and long-term advantages. The rejection of uh, deflation is ultimately a special interest splitting. That's what it is. Right? Because, of course, some people will be negatively affected. In a, in a debt economy. They will lose their property. Right? Companies, uh, entrepreneurs uh, operating with whatever, uh, equity ratio of 10%, they have 90% uh, credit, right? I mean, they, they, they are likely to, to lose in such an environment. They are likely to lose their company. That's hard for them, but again, if they now say, well, we have to do something against deflation, that's ultimately a special interest splitting. And they say, save me, from my creditors, for all the people who want to buy my company if I go bankrupt. That's ultimately what it is. And we have to say that uh, life goes on after deflation. Right? Life goes on for all of them. It goes on for government. And governments, uh, well, it's true if, if, if a, a really deflation hits the economy and the government goes bankrupt, well, government, of course, will not be taken over, maybe unfortunately so. Right? But uh, if they are no longer able to pay back the, live up to their promises, so they cannot pay back the debt, right? the debt ceiling is not increased, we default. Oh. So this means we will no longer be able to take out credit. Now, but maybe this is, well, not maybe, but actually this is not a bad thing. Uh, it's not a bad thing because, uh, well, yeah, I mean, probably I should go into this, this point a little bit more detail because I won't have time to address the, the other scenario anyway, because my time is running out. Um, it's, it's actually a good thing that governments have to live up uh, to this reality because it would force them to live with tax revenue. If governments can no longer finance themselves with debt, they have to live with tax revenue. Now, According to the, the classical theory of uh, democracy, a theory that has been articulated in the Middle Ages and then was uh, very strongly endorsed by the American revolutionaries, this public finance 
or the, the limitation of government to tax revenue has a very important democratic function. It is, in fact, this limited budget that forces governments under the will of the citizens. And according to the classic democratic theory, if a government wished to expand its activities, it had to ask the citizens to increase tax payments. It had to make tax payments politically, tax hikes politically acceptable. Only then could governments increase their activities. And so the citizens could control their agents, namely the government, by giving or withdrawing consent to the budget. Now, if governments can take out credit, and if they can, uh, even worse, just print the money that they need for their expenditure, then they can circumvent this control through the citizenry. Right? If a government can just print the money it needs for, for its expenditure, or if it can at will increase its, its debts, then this means that it can increase its activities, can increase its expenditure without asking consent from the citizens. That is, government through these financial techniques, tends to become tyrannical. Therefore, the American revolutionaries were very strongly against this, or at least uh, some of them, not Hamilton. Right? So the point is, and this is actually a good thing, right? it would reinforce democratic control over the government. Life would go on also for uh, corporate finance. Right? Corporations would just have different owners. That's a point that we addressed already. And life would go on uh, also for households. Right? Let's say if there was really a very strong inflation today in the United States, price level dropped to whatever, 50% or 20% of, of the current level. I don't think that's very likely, but let's see. Consider this. Then clearly, most American households that still have any mortgage uh, debt would be immediately bankrupt. Okay? So most Americans would have to leave their house. That is, more precisely speaking, they wouldn't have to leave their house, but they, again, they, they would have a different kind of contract, right? Because you have all these houses now that, that still exist, right? That's, again, it's the same argument, the same consideration as in the case of companies. All the houses still exist. What do the, the owners of the houses, the creditors who now own the houses, or the people who buy the houses at a very low price, what would they do with them? And they say, I'm a guy who has, has no debt at all, and then I... Uh, I'm waiting for the deflation to hit, and then I buy off all of my neighbors. I buy the entire neighborhood. Right? Well, I own all houses now in town. So what do I do with 25 or 250 houses? What do I do with them? I cannot possibly use them for myself, so what I will do is to rent them. So ultimately, what will happen in this case, as far as indebted households are concerned, is that they would simply rent, rather than pretend being the owner of the houses and pay anyway. Right? So the, the payment would actually be lower, right? and they would be renters rather than nominal owners. And so again, from an aggregate point of view, would be no substantial change, would be a change of ownership titles. Okay, I think, uh, and this is also why I addressed uh, this scenario of a, of a currency reform first, I think that this is the essential, this is the essential, these are the essential considerations that we have to address here, so I will skip now uh, price deflation in, in a growing economy. Oh, well, maybe I, I will do the first two charts. Well, this is actually, yeah, this is a nice thing. I will conclude on this. All right, so in, in price deflation, uh, in a growing economy, so we have two takes on the causes of, uh, uh, of economic growth. The first one is the mercantilist uh, theory that has been revived in the 20th century by John Maynard Keynes according to which uh, aggregate consumer spending and aggregate spending in general are the two causes of economic growth. And so the price level uh, is, uh, is therefore necessary as well to stabilize the price, prevent the prices ever fall. According uh, to this school of thought, there is a paradox of savings. Right? Savings are uh, paradoxical in that they bring about greater wealth for an individual. I can enrich myself by increased uh, savings, right? I spend less on consumer goods and whatever. I buy a piece of land or I buy a firm or something else. I enrich myself. But if everybody did the same thing, then um, 
it would actually be the, the opposite that, ha that happens. Because if everybody saves more, then there would be a strong decline on the expenditure uh, of, uh, of the expenditure on consumer goods. So therefore, uh, the revenues of the firms would diminish, and uh, firms therefore would invest less. Right? Would have to cut their cost. If they cut, uh, cut their costs, then the revenues of, of people will fall. They would even spend less money on consumer goods and so on. Right? So we would enter into a deflationary spiral, and if the economy would sink into a bottomless pit. So savings work from an individual point of view, but we cannot generalize this. Right? Generalizing this finding would be a fallacy of composition. Right? It's something that all economic students learn in the first year would be a fallacy of composition. From an aggregate point of view, savings are very harmful. The saver is ultimately, from the mercantilist Keynesian point of view, he's an egotistical maniac who just thinks of himself and not of the greater good. If he really cared for his country men and women, he would spend the hell on consumer goods. <laughs> so, in order to prevent that savings entails such terrible results, we have to do something. Uh, we have to prevent that aggregate spending diminishes. And let me just point out in passing again that this is also the opinion of the Wieserian ring of the Austrian economists, right? They also think that aggregate spending has to be stabilized in all price. So in the 18th century, uh, before Adam Smith, there was actually not much that could be uh, done uh, uh, to, to prop up uh, aggregate spending. There were some experiments with uh, fiat money, but in most countries, it was very reluctant to, to make this step. So in most countries, uh, governments pursued a trade policy, or they used trade policy to prop up aggreg aggregate spending. Trade policy means I intervene into the market in order to encourage exports and to discourage imports. So if our companies export more, then more money that is gold and silver in those days flow into the country. If I discourage imports, then less money flows out of the country. So ultimately, more money will circulate within our borders, so aggregate spending increases. Wonderful. Today, uh, trade policy is no longer used uh, for, for this purpose uh, because we have central banks who can uh, produce immaterial fiat money. We to, today, then, these central banks are, oh, wait a minute, uh, spenders of last resort and conduct these, uh, this type of expansionary monetary policy. But the causes of growth uh, are perce perceived very differently according to the classical economists and to the Austrian school, which carries on the, the classical heritage. Uh, in this tradition, the two causes of uh, economic growth are parsimony, the division of labor, and innovation, as we've already seen. Uh, and these economists hold that the spending level is irrelevant, the price level is irrelevant, and savings are not paradoxical. So we've already seen that the price level is irrelevant and the, the spending level is irrelevant previous considerations. Now let me just point out why savings are not paradoxical. So there must be obviously some error here. Right? In uh, my lecture on Monday, we have seen that uh, savings are actually necessary. This is, is the physical necessary precondition in order to carry out longer production processes. Okay? In order to engage in roundabout production, we need to have saved before in order to enable consumption during the longer production process. We've seen that an economy can operate well in a deflationary environment, from an aggregate point of view. Now the Keynesians make a common sense point, the mercantilists, and then the Keynesians just warm this up. If corporate revenues fall, well, then companies have to cut cost expenditure, so revenues will fall and so on. So what's the error here? The error is actually the one that the Keynesians reproach to the classical economists. Again, you say, well, you are committing a fallacy of composition. You're generalizing a result that holds true for an individual. An individual can enrich himself, but not a country as a whole through increased savings. But they themselves commit a fallacy of composition. Because the problem they envision holds true only for an individual company. If an individual company in a market economy is confronted with a declining revenue, 
then it cannot cut, uh, cut its costs. Let's say all other companies are operating as before. My company experiences a, a reduced demand. I had a revenue of 120 before. Now my revenue is, shrinks to 60. Now what happens now? I would have to cut costs. I go and see my suppliers. I make a big convention of all my suppliers and all my collaborators, all my employees and so on. And I hold my deflation talk. It's like, friends, we need to cut costs. We all have to operate with a, with a smaller belt and, and so on. You've got to work for half of the money that before. And then they smile at me and say, look, I mean, we'll just go next door and work for those guys. Right? So it will not work for me. I will go bankrupt. But here, of course, in the case of a general increase of savings, general reduction of consumer expenditure, all companies are confronted to this problem. Right? All companies are confronted to, or more or less all, right? because there's a Cantillon effect, but more or less all uh, companies are confronted to lower revenue. So in all companies, uh, the entrepreneurs will make the big convention with all their collaborators, and they will hold exactly this kind of talk. And then people will look around and see, well, everywhere else, the same problem exists. So we have the choice of either working at a lower monetary revenue or just uh, not eat <laughs> in the months to come. And then, of course, people will do precisely this. They will accept a cut in revenue. And the economy will work as before. Okay. So even here, so then, savings are not paradoxical. Right? The Keynesians suffer from precisely the fallacy that they... Uh, reproach to their opponents, I mean the fallacy of composition. So the causes of, uh, of growth are then private initiative and government interventions hamper associations of firms and encourage frivolous behavior. Okay, now very fast, oh, 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 oh very fast. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll switch to my, to my general conclusions. All right, so the, the general conclusion is... Um, The following. Well, this is a page like I here. And all considerations about deflation and also about inflation must start from the following point: an economy can, a market economy can work well, irrespective of the price level, irrespective of the tendency of the price level, in a growing and a shrinking price level. The economy can work well, irrespective of the level of aggregate spending, and it can work irrespective of the tendency of aggregate spending. It can work well irrespective of the money supply. All else is uh, a fallback into mercantilist fallacies. And this implies then that price deflation resulting from uh, monetary reform or from savings-based growth and so on is <coughs> beneficial. The deflation poses a short-run problem for a debt-ridden economy. The problem, as we have seen, consists in transferring assets from bankrupt debtors to creditors and buyers. And even when deflation hits such a debt-ridden economy, it provides substantial medium and long-run advantages. There's reduced debt, there's reduced fragility of the economy, there's a greater role for owner entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs who are not just puppets of the bankers who have lent them money, but who are the owners of their, of their company, true owners. And a diminished role, therefore, for bankers and other intermediaries. These uh, uh, conclusions should not be interpreted as implying that uh, governments should do something to freeze the money supply. That would be a fallacy, too. Right? It's not because inflation is not harmful that the government should try to prevent any increase of the money supply. It does not imply either that uh, governments should try to actively bring about deflation. Right? So it's not the same thing either. We just have to uh, uh, be relaxed about these things. Uh, and the, the first, of course, the, the political implication is that uh, one of the main justifications for uh, the existence of central banks, namely the fight uh, against deflation, is pointless right, from an overall point of view. And central banks are the agents of special interests and right, robbing the general population to prevent bankruptcy of those who should, in fact, go bankrupt. Thank you for your attention.